they have to have the mentality that any points that they are given back to them are a positive right now, and they have to just keep focusing on, on moving forward, thinking forward, and going after it game after game. There's also the second charge hanging over them as well, Jamie. So we may not know right until the end point of the season or even beyond the end of the season well, that, the that status of Everton, which is extraordinary, especially if we talk about a club that's been in, this, in the top division for such a long time, 70 years. Yeah, I mean, that can't happen in, in terms of this going to pass the, the end of the season. I don't see how that is even feasible. And it's not just about Everton, it's all the clubs around them. And when we talk about how Everton are dealing with their situation, uh, obviously, I think we'll find out this week and there may be something else to come maybe at the sort of the end of March. It's how it affects other clubs as well. It, you could actually argue that certain clubs are being galvanised by it. You actually think of sort of Luton, you know, that, that should be giving them energy. And, and I also go back to how poor Sheffield United and Burnley have been. And they could look at themselves at the end of a season and go, we were so poor in the Premier League. If we would just had a normal season that a promoter club normally has in and around relegation, we may have actually stayed up because Everton and Nottingham Forest have actually been deducted points, you know. So, uh, yeah, it, this is not just about the two clubs, uh, Everton now, but also Nottingham Forest is coming, but also how it affects so many other teams. So I can't see a, a situation where it is allowed to go but into you, the you, end of the season. You live in the city, you hear what people are talking about. You know, everyone is talking about the fact some points might come back. It would be a hammer blow if they didn't, wouldn't it? Yeah, listen, I would expect some points to come back. I, I would because I think I think the initial reaction from everybody in football when they've seen the 10-point deduction was, whoa, that, that, that feels har harsh. Yes, Everton admitted the breach, so there's going to be some sort of sanction. No one... What should it be? Because it's never happened before. So there's, a, there's, a, there's that grey area there. But I think when it came through, I think everyone thought, oof. And I think that basically killed the January transfer market because I think that scared a lot of clubs basically in January that thinking that we can't afford to you know get close to the line with, with FFP, PSR, whatever you want to call it and I think it almost stole the transfer market in the Premier League in the, in January because they're scared about the repercussions of what sort of Everton have got and what's to come but the big thing for me is that I think Everton will get something back. I think it'll be small. I think it could be two, three points maximum. I don't know. But there's a feeling within football in the last couple of days, people we've spoken to, that Nottingham Forest fear they're getting points taken off them for the situation they find themselves in. So Everton are in the same boat as them. Whether it's exactly the same, I don't know. So that would also be a big worry if, you know, you get points back, but then you're always getting taken off again. So, yeah, it's... Uh, it's not a good time to be an Evertonian right now. Yeah, or indeed a Forest fan, I suppose, in that sense. And it's all speculation right now. We, we should say that. Um, but it just creates this huge uncertainty for all those teams down at the bottom of the table, including Crystal Palace, who decided to change their manager. Roy Hodgson has, has stepped away. Uh, they announced that earlier this afternoon. And Oliver Glasner is the new man in charge, or will be, we presume, from tomorrow. This was Paddy McCarthy's team tonight. He was the man making the decisions, along with Ray Lewington. We're told he didn't speak to Oliver Glasner, but what struck you was was the similarities what you were talking about a Glasner team looks like that you've seen in action straight away from Palace this evening. Yeah, and maybe that was a little bit of the poker face, you know, not giving Everton much away that, that this is what they were going to try to attempt was to play the exact playing model that Oliver Glasner will be bringing uh, to the team. It starts with a direct ball forward. Ten right? seconds from and goal I kick to ball to, in the net. Sorry, I mean, obviously the analysis you did was brilliant before the game. Jesse on sort of... Glasner's Frankfurt team and how narrow the front three are. I just thought it was really interesting that the first challenge there is between sort of the, the outside left or inside left, if you like, for Crystal Palace, but also that's Everton's right back. Normally mm -hmm. you'd see a striker and a centre back going yes. for that ball. Does that show how narrow they are? The fact that it's actually Ben Godfrey going for the first header. Yeah, I, I, there, you know, he's normally addressing what would be a winger, but yes. now he's playing against a team that's playing three attacking players all within the centre circle, like we talked before the match. There's your front three. And so, especially in long ball situations, what you see is an overload from Palace, and, and notice how they're all in front of their uh, opponent, so that if the ball comes free, they're in position. IU moves up. It's not a pure counter-pressing. It's not a pure second ball situation, but the tightness of the front three leads to him being able to pick up a loose ball and create an advantageous moment, almost out of nothing. That helps any tactic, though, putting a goal in like yeah, that, doesn't it? Yeah, that's a good finish. Jordan Lowe's <laughs> third of the season. Yeah, we see it again there, and you're talking about, as I said, getting ahead of people, use his body well there. And I just thought, you know, you see the, 
Let's talk about this system again. It's difficult for the fullback because normally he's got to come around his centre back. Yep. He's expected maybe this guy to maybe make a run inside here, make a run inside here. So is it actually difficult to pick up players who just find themselves in those half spaces there? Playing against this kind of football once in, in Salzburg, we tried playing three in the back, almost thinking like we were going to have our three around their three. And what happened was their wing backs were beating us to the races both up and back the up and down the pitch. And so we learned from that and, and said, okay, we're going to deal with it with four for three, but we're going to be aggressive with our fullbacks to step in and rest the fence and mark their wider of the three attacking players. And, and then you need your midfielders to really come back and double down and help close the space mm -hmm. so that there's not enough room for them to pick up balls. But this is a lot of what they did the whole game. When there were long balls, they were able to be narrow. They were able to pick up second balls. They were able to put quick combinations together, not five, six, seven, eight pass sequences, mm -hmm. two and three pass sequences that would lead them into dangerous moments. And that's a lot of what the system is built to do. And I think that just lends itself to sort of the setup tonight, some of the things that we saw. It's, listen, we'll never know, but it is intriguing about was there a slight influence from the new manager or was that a case of actually the, the Crystal Palace staff are talking about, well, okay, we know this guy's coming in, he likes to play, you know, back three, he likes to do certain things, we'll try and implement it before the game. Listen, it, it just, I thought it was intriguing and interesting that there's something a little My different. feeling was there was no doubt that Oli Glasner had an effect <laughs> on what was happening there. Well, okay. how would that have happened? With a little phone call? With a, I don't know. Was it the training ground? I don't know. You know, I mean, there was a lot for them to have to toss around this week. Obviously, the respect level they have for Roy Hodgson and what he's meant for the club and what he's meant to English football and certainly taking care of his health situation and making sure everyone wanting to feel like he's on his feet. Um, but we know that Oliver Glasner has been in the country and been around and watching matches and, and that, that he's been connected with the club. So it, it's not... It's not out of the question for me, mm. for him to have some kind of impact on, mm. on what went on. They were, what was it, 10 minutes away from their first clean sheet in 14 games as well, and he was looking pretty happy. And the significance of the equalising goal, if that hadn't come, Crystal Palace would have been eight points clear of the bottom three, which would have been huge for them uh, in terms of a step towards survival. But yet again, Jamie, this set piece is such a tool for Everton. Over 50% of their goals now have come from set pieces and they are, they are remarkable. But, I mean, whatever you say about set pieces, you've got to start with the delivery and they do have a guy who can put the ball in a certain area. Dwight McNeil, obviously, uh, Sean Dyche knows him really well, did a similar job for him at Burnley, but he puts it in the right spot. But you've also got to say, the leap from Anana is absolutely fantastic and I think of some of the great centre-forwards Everton have had in the past, namely a Duncan Ferguson or a Graham Sharp at that back post, the leap to get up early, beat the goalkeeper, and almost hang there, waiting for that ball just to head it in at the Gladys Street end. Brilliant jump. And we talk about, you know, good football, passing football, different types of football, but sometimes there's nothing better than seeing a guy just really get up off his feet, Jesse, and just punch one in with his head. Will, winning duels, right? When the, when the game needs a, a, a special moment. I will say, Daesh made a, an adjustment once they went down one goal, and he could see that there was space on the wings and that often Crystal Palace would leave their two wing backs to leave with that space. So he started creating two V1s on the wing with Godfrey and, and Harrison specifically, yeah. and it allowed them to put more balls in the box, more crosses, which we talked about, 23 in the second half, and ultimately that gave them momentum to get back in the match. They almost get a couple of uh, uh, crossing, heading goals, one that came from uh, Calvert, mm -hmm. Calvert Lewin, and then ultimately some set piece chances in a goal. But that, that's, that, that is Everton football in a nutshell, really. That's what Everton fans buy into. I wouldn't say the first half, because I sometimes do think, even under Sean Dice, they're a little bit reactive Everton. You know, you probably what what you see second half, you probably want to see a little bit more first half. But that what you saw second half, attacking the Gladys Street end, set pieces, getting crosses in, Calvert Lewin actually heading things down, getting involved. That is that is what Everton's supposed to be brought on. It's when you're, a long time. Sorry, Sorry, when you're a manager of this kind of game and you play like that after you go down, always you're trying to get your team play with that kind of urgency mm -hmm. from the start. If so you can it, play with that urgency from the start, then the game looks entirely different. Okay, so would you put that more on the players or would you put on on so sort of the manager, how he sets up it's to both. start with? It's both, right? I mean, you, you, you prepare a team to know exactly what the game's going to require 
and obviously at home in a big moment where you need points, you have to make sure that the team is ready to fly out there from the start. We talked about it at the we beginning. The game, yeah. If they could get the lead, this would be massive for them. They go down, but to be fair, the response was fantastic. The Premier League average for set-piece goals is 19%. The amount of your goals from set-piece is 19%. This is the top four. Wolves, Arsenal, Luton and Everton way out in front. 52% of their goals, as Jamie's was saying, 14 set-piece goals out of the 27. Is that a positive or a negative, though? It's a positive, 100%. I mean, obviously you want more goals, but being dangerous on set-pieces, 52% is, is a massive number. And, it, and, and as we talked, even when we, when we looked at the quadrant where Everton was the lowest in the league for XG and, and shot percentage, if they can now find ways to be a little bit more productive in the run of play, maybe in transition when they win balls, and they can count on the fact that they're going to always be dangerous from set pieces, that's definitely a recipe for them to, to gain more points. I, I, I think it's very good because when you're a manager, you, you know better than me, Sean Dice. He's got Calvert-Lewin, who now hasn't scored in 19 games. He's got, he's got a serious lack of confidence right throughout the squad. Not just confidence, probably composure, quality in front of goal. But... What can he really affect in, in attack and play? Really difficult on the finish, maybe the build up, the positions to get to. But a set piece is a stop. You can something you can work on. Right, where are we attacking? What, what areas are we attacking? Where do we want the ball? It's really, it's, it's a lot easier probably to set up than it would be in free play. You don't know exactly where your players are going to be or where the ball's going to be. So we can have a real effect on that. So Everton probably have to do more work on that than anybody because they're so poor in front of goal in free play. And sometimes the percentage can be skewed a little bit because of, you know, you don't get as many goals as other teams in open play. But you actually look at the numbers. The numbers are not a very... There's only Arsenal. And let's not forget Arsenal, who've got more, will get a lot more set pieces probably because they dominate games more, they get more corners. So, as I said, what Everton are doing from set piece-wise is phenomenal. And this is Jesse's career so far. We've got to say so far, Jesse, because I'm sure there's a lot to come. Most recently at Leeds United. Before that, the experience with the Red Bull group with, in Germany with Leipzig. Before that, in Austria with Salzburg and uh, in New York as well. The coaching career, though, Jesse, started with Bob Bradley. Just how important as a figure was he for you in your coaching development? Yeah, so I met Bob when he was 31. And he became my university coach at Princeton University. And then I followed him throughout my professional career, and we worked together at a, a few different clubs. Um, and then I became uh, part of his staff for the 2010 World Cup. And I would say, in general, he introduced the mentality of what high-level football was in our country at that time. And he challenged players and certainly challenged me to think about how to grow, how to develop, how to push myself, what real work was like. And, and that sort of set the tone for who I became. Do you think he was disrespected when he came to England? Yeah, of course he was. I, there was a lot of things that probably weren't necessary in his treatment. Obviously, with all these things, I always say winning solves everything. So if he gets a couple more wins in his time at Swansea, then maybe the opinion of him is different. The thing I know about him is he dedicates his life entirely to his teams and to the development of his teams. And so, you know, I know that it hurt him to be treated in certain ways, and it hurt all of us, I think, who know Well, as, as a follow-up question, to, to that of Jamie's, do you think you were disrespected because of your accent? Maybe sometimes, but I, I don't worry about it too much. You know, I, I always knew that w whenever I came to Europe and wherever I was going to work, that I would have to earn respect. And I'm okay with that. That's part of what professional sports is and what, I, what this life is. So I just enjoy the opportunity to work with good players and good teams and, and try to push myself personally to the highest level that I can and to, to be the best I can be. Well, you certainly did that when you moved into the, to the, the Red Bull group, all-encompassing, which was first at New York and then, of course, to Salzburg and Leipzig. Was it a case of, of you taking your ideas to them or joining the Red Bull group? Were you taking their ideas and, and putting them into practice? Yeah, my first discussion with anyone from Red Bull came when I interviewed with Gerard Houllier and Ralph Rangnick uh, to, to take over the New York Red Bulls. And, you know, Gerard became a big friend and proponent of mine and, and almost like a father figure. Any of us who knew Gerard, I think, had that kind of relationship with him. And I, 
I was trying to express in the first conversation that I had with him what my thoughts were on the type of football I wanted to play. And Ralph was really quiet at the table, and I was mostly talking with Gerard. And then when I started talking more about counterpressing and about playing in transition, all of a sudden Ralph came alive. And, and that's when we kind of made a connection. And, and I think the main reason why they kind of brought me into the Red Bull group and took me under their wing was because we had similar philosophies. Well, let's take us to the clips. I mean, some of the things that we're going to look at. And, and I, th I think when I hear any young coach come into the game, like you talk about pressing and energy. I mean, could you just explain this clip and what's happening yeah. here. Yeah, so in general, I tried to put some scenes together from games and from training where you asked me, OK, talk a little bit about Red Bull philosophy and then how you implement it with the teams that you've coached. We just talked about Oliver Glasner a lot in this, and, and he has a specific way of also interpreting a lot of the concepts and principles of Red, Red, Red Bull football as in his own tactical methodology. And so, you know, in th with this team right here, we're, we're, we're playing uh, with the ball against two strikers in a buildup where it's more three in the back. So that's how we will manipulate. We'll, we'll play four in the back if we're having three attacking us, and we'll play often three in the back if there's two. So... In, these, in this scene, I want to talk about minimum width and the net, okay? So you can see when the ball's on the far side that this left winger isn't just standing on the touchline. He's thinking about the connection that he has with the team and in the net and always anticipating what happens if we win a moment and maybe we put a connection together that's going to lead us to goal and what happens if we try to connect through the middle and we lose it and how is he going to react to help counterpress and make sure that we can win it back as quickly so, as possible. So that, that position base, if you get through there, he's narrow, he can basically attack the goal, yes. but he can also get back in here. Exactly. Is that what it is? Imagine that we get down that wing, and now we need numbers in the box. If he's at this touchline, it's too far for him yeah. to run to be really dangerous in that moment. And if we lose it, it's too hard for him to help defend and counterpress in these, in these areas and positions. So we'll, we'll see as this goes a little bit. So here it comes to the other side. It's Josko Guvardiol now with Man City. We create a little overplay. Now here again, you see the net compressing to this side. And generally what we like ahead of the ball are what we call counter movements. So it's better in this position if the striker comes a little bit more here as Schobelschlei starts to run away in Cuckoo on the far side. And the function of everything we do then is overplay, close, close enough, that we can counterpress far enough apart that we can manipulate that, that, the opponent. I mean, you, you've got to explain that one to me because when I look at that, that's my big thing about the Red Bull model. When I hear about the system, about how narrow it is, my feeling is sometimes you're so tight without the ball and compact. When you win the ball, how how can you get the passes away to each other? So if we're almost talking about a perfect sort of setup that the transition can happen at any time yes. with or without the ball, yes. and you're in a position to go forward with the ball, but also defend for the team. And is this what these triangles are yes. that we highlighted before the game? And again, imagine that the striker's here instead of there. And so then anywhere that you lose the ball around the pitch, you have numbers close enough to go and compete to win the ball right back. And still, you're creating the kinds of movements and spacing where you have options to play forward and still think about what are you trying to achieve in possession, okay? So if we continue with this action... It goes forward. We actually lose the ball. Schobelschlei has a really good reaction, comes back and wins it. Pause. But you can also see already that he's thinking about rest defense on that side because if we get caught in transition, he has to honor that responsibility. Now we do play backward, but we do it with purpose of thinking about how quickly can we advance ourselves to the other side. So now there's pressure. Pause. Okay. Again, you have these counter movements. Okay, so you have a little connection here. It's a little pass back. It's going to come back in here. And Cuckoo's going to take off in the half lane where we're always trying to attack the space in the box in the half lane because that's the most dangerous place to cross from. And in the end, Schobelschlei will be the one who scores. And Cuckoo makes a little counter movement run. It comes here. It's a 1-2. Schobelschlei wins the race to the first post. And right now, they already know the goal will be scored at the first post. It goes there. It's a fantastic goal. So, so can you, I just wanted to ask you about this because I go back to sort of any manager coming into the game will say, I, I love the way Klopp plays. I love the way Pep plays. I want to press from the front. I want to push up high. The Red Bull model is all the teams play a similar sort of way. 
But not anybody can become the manager there. You've obviously had that job. I mean, how would you coach it? How would you train it? So, first thing, Red Bull's kind of described in a lot of different ways. I've heard it as pressing football. I've heard it as gegen pressing, counter pressing football. For me, it's about controlling spaces. And you can already see with this concept of how we use the net and what it means to make sure that we're compact enough at all moments to control whatever happens, but also wide enough to have space to be able to play the kind of football we want to play. In this exercise, we put the goal at the 18 that we're defending and we're playing with no goalkeeper. 18 yard line. Yeah, right? And so when we play with, and, and the opponent can score, can shoot on the goal once they get past the half line. So what it does is it forces every player tactically to understand where we want to be to try to create angles and opportunities to play with the ball in combination in possession. But for sure, anytime we lose it, we have to be close enough to counter press and we have to be close enough with rest defense in the back. Can I ask you something about that then? When, when, you know that actual session you're talking about? Is that your session or would that be a session that's almost in the Red Bull sort of methodology coaching book for all the teams about this yeah. is the style we want to play. These are the sessions that go with it. So we, we have a lot of training methodologies and similar training um, exercises. This one was something that we came up with on our own. And again, we, we will often create provocational rules. Sometimes I'll say if we play a, a lower division team or we're in preseason, we're going to play an opponent that we know we're better than, that anytime the opponent connects a pass in our defensive half, their attacking half, that's a point against us. And again, it's the same emphasis. It's now being so concentrated on the tactical details and responsibilities and the connections we have in the team at, in every phase of the game that they're never able to get out of their half yeah. and we are controlling the opponent. This is Leeds, okay. Jesse, yeah? This is at Leeds. And this is in training. So, uh, so explain this setup for us. So, now. you know, here we are with our starting group where we have three in the back, two sixes. This is our uh, Luke Ayling playing our wing back here. Jack Harrison's out there. We have a striker and two tens. And again, we're trying to manipulate how we play and what our tactics are with the ball. Specifically, we like to overload what we call the red zone. The red zone we call the space in between the opponent's back line and midfield line. And we like to now have dynamic movements, counter movements in those spaces because it's difficult for the back line and the midfield line to know who's supposed to deal with what. And when they're done dynamically, you can't react fast enough to defend. Mm. So, but in this, there'll be a few different topics, right? So here we're looking to get to the red zone, play forward, turning inside, and then looking to go vertically with a counter movement, right? Which leads us to goal, okay? Whenever we get the ball in the red zone, we want to turn inside. Now we're pressing and we're closing, pause. And you see how aggressive our back line is. So we just talked before about Branthwaite and how he has to always be on the half turn and ready to step in to defend, but also ready if the body language of the player on the ball is to play behind, that they're ready to react and cover space behind. And certainly you need a goalkeeper as a last defender, but here they don't have that. It's so the full responsibility falls on the back line to have exactly the proper behavior to deal with the moment. You, you, you talked about the Red Bull sort of model almost being about space and where your teammate is. And I, and I speak a lot on this show because a lot of teams press from the front and, they say, and they've got a high line. Well, if you press from the front, you've got to have a high line because you said you've got to control space. You've yeah. got to be close together. So is that when you're talking about them being, if they're aggressive at the front, they have no option yes. but to be aggressive at the back. Yes. And actually, what in these situations, what can hurt you more than the long ball behind you is the balls underneath that the opponent is able to catch in their red zone to create combinations and then run through your back line. So just like we talked about with Oliver Glasner, you have to make sure that you have an aggressive back line and you're ready to forward defend and now make sure that you're going to win those balls, play forward, and go into the attack from there, which is what happens here. Right? We're compact. We win the ball. We look to play forward. Forward again, turning inside, combination, running into the half lane running hard, sprinting into the box, tap-in. So we want 80% of our plays in the run of play to be tap-ins. This is it, fundamental, From right? moments like that. This, this, this is, I wouldn't say a buzzword, but certainly since Jürgen Klopp come to yeah. sort of Liverpool, been there sort of 89 years now, it was all about gag and pressing, counter-pressing. This yep. is what we associate. 
not just with Klopp, probably with German football and certain again, sort of the teams that and, you've and, and Pep. And Pep, yeah, what yeah. he did at Barcelona, right? So, and again, if you don't have the appropriate tactical arrangement, okay, so if your players are too spread out yeah. and you play with players on the touchline always and you're thinking about big switches, I don't care how good the reactions are for your team, you cannot be a good counterpressing team. Counterpressing has so much to do with the tactical distances that your team has when you have the ball. Mm. That is the purpose of the net, right? And then now you can make sure that when you lose the ball, you can converge on the ball from several angles and pause. The, the other part is the rest defense in the back, which rest defense is a term derived from rest verteidiger, okay, German in German, defense. which means remainder defending. All right, the but we players yes, defending. So that in the back, the remainder attacking players that aren't really part of the defensive unit, that those players are defended while we are in possession of the ball. Okay, and that is a paramount, important tactical topic if you want to also be a good counterpressing team. It's a big part of being a centre back, Dan. I mean. You speak to younger players especially, and that thing of a, of, a, of a defender, you get up to the halfway line, you're high, and too many defenders then start watching the game. Yes. They're almost just watching the spectating. They're not actually still in the game in terms of being rest defence, but basically trying to sustain the attack. Yes. As soon as the ball comes out, you win the ball back, and that happens far too often where you see a defender just stood there watching the game. And, of course, when you play in the stadium and there's energy and it's a big match and you, of course, everybody's hoping that they can find a way to, to, to win in these moments. But, again, not being satisfied with playing back, playing forward, seeing things forward, running into the half lane, not crossing from outside the box, getting into more dangerous moments, flat balls across with runners in the box. Right, here's another little moment where the six has to drop away to always be thinking about where do, what's my ideal position for where I need to be for what we're trying to achieve in possession, but also I need to balance it out with the distances I have from the opponent that if we lose the ball, I can be close enough that we can go back and win it. That balance in the team tactically is incredibly important. And then, obviously, the reactions that fit along with that. Win it back. Maybe it's a foul in that instance, but nonetheless, the point is getting those distances right. So here we are in a match, right? This is, is this you at Leeds. Yes. So we're in this formation. It's a similar look as to what we were trying to do in Leipzig. We're trying to create room in the, in the red zone. So go ahead and play it. And so we're in this build-up phase where we have three against two. Our sixes are looking forward. Our sixes are drawing the opponent out, which means it opens up our red zone. But notice that we're not standing on the touchline. We're still connected in a way that no, if we win it or if we lose it, we're in an advantageous position. Right, we play forward, a good touch inside again. Maybe he could play vertical. He goes to the wing, pause. So Luke takes a, not the best touch, but nonetheless, he's looking to play inside. But for me, the best play is if Luke attacks a pass with Brendan Aronson into the half lane, which allows him to catch the ball here and either shoot or pass it across the goal for Rodrigo to run in for a tap-in. I mean, you, you talk about that, and you talk about this being sort of your model. I was speaking about this on Saturday night with Manchester City. There's no one better than Man City. Get into that yes, position for the great pullback. But now even more important, pause. Right? Is this counter pressing? Look at the reaction. Look at the reaction. Look at the reaction. Zero transfer time. Zero transfer time around the ball. Talk us through the rest defense again. And then the rest defense. So, rest defense is always ideal to be one plus one, right? So, here we're 3v2. You could say we're 4v3. But the most important detail is that there is no player free. So if we have to go 3v3, if we have to go 4v4, if we have to go 2v2, then we have to do it. And it's a big demand on the center back. At what stage of a game would you do? Would you start the game with that idea in terms of we might have to be, man, not man for man, but almost we're not going to need the spare man? Or would that be a case sometimes in the game where you say, OK, we're one down or we need a goal, we're going to push an extra man forward and the rest of the defense actually becomes man for man? Every match is equipped with a rest defense match plan. 
okay? Now, the game is fluid and changing all the time. And if you were even to look in the practice, Robin Cook is pointing at different times, Liam Cooper, because it requires communication. It's not so easy to always go, okay, you got him. You have to always be aware and you have to be communicating and pointing and making sure that there are no free players, okay? But the plus one is always the goal. And that's why even when you build three against two, you already for rest defense, once you overplay, you already have that built into your team. Okay, and then you have to make sure that not only are you tight, but when the ball gets played forward, pause. When he has the ball here, if you look, there's literally no solution for West Ham to play out. They have nowhere to play. We're putting pressure on the ball. He has to release the ball, and we're all tight. It's ours, and that's the goal. As soon as you lose it, to give the opponent zero opportunity to play out because you own the space, you own the positioning, you are in control of the match. We're not back here. We have pushed this opponent back. They are up a goal. So that's where they're going to defend deep. We don't need anyone back here. You'll even see Liam Cooper where he could be higher and help deal with, uh, I think it's Solanka how, how or maybe hard, more. How, how hard is that? Because I think when I was going up playing as a centre defender, you see it now, we almost push up as a centre defender. You get to the halfway line and it's like you hit a brick wall and everyone yeah. thinks I'm on the halfway yeah. line. How difficult is it to maybe to play as you have never being used to actually going that high up, especially for centre-backs. Does yeah, that yeah. take a lot of work? It, once the, what's important is, of course, it's, it's reinforcing behaviours. But once they feel the positive effect that it has, when the unit is clear and attached to the tactics and now making sure that the opponent has no space, it becomes infectious and contagious that they want to be in these positions and they want to, they'd rather be more aggressive than more passive. And that's what I build into training every day. It comes from the tactic of locking them in and, and again, not pressing for me, not counter pressing, but controlling the space. Mm. So there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of amazing ideas and I find that just fascinating watching you two talking us through it. How quickly were you able to implement those ideas at Leeds United? Yeah, I would say the counter-pressing, uh, which was already a Bielsa topic, was something that we were able to work on. But it was Sorry, just to point out to the viewers, these are the first 12 results okay. when, you, when you came yeah. in, which kept Leeds United um, up, ultimately. I th almost the first two matches were for me more than the team. Like, to, it, you know, I had to... The Leicester game, we performed really well. Then at home was my first match I, that I, I coached uh, at... At Ellen, Ellen Road, Road yeah. and I created a too passive of a match plan. So even I said to them after the game, I said, guys, I, I'm, I'm learning the same way you are. And in that process, they were really good with like, listen, when we go to Wolves, this is what the game's like, and we need to be like this. And so I would always use their information and their experiences to help me understand what each game would require. But yeah, there were some things that came quickly. The, one of the toughest part was the, the idea of ball-orientated pressing versus what they had been done in the past, which was man-marking, man right? The, breaking them of their feeling that, ah, that's my man, Jamie's my man, I gotta stay with him. Breaking them away from that and saying, no, we're all going closer to the ball and we're gonna be ready to press together. That was probably the biggest challenge. You had some tough fixtures along the way. I mean, those three red defeats towards the end there, Man City, Arsenal and Chelsea. And I think a lot of Leeds fans were probably fearing the worst at that point, particularly after they weren't able to beat Brighton. It came down to this dramatic last day against Brentford. What a feeling, though, Jesse. Yeah. How confident were you that it was going to be a happy ending? I felt like our team was ready to perform. You know, I thought we had a good match plan. <laughs> Great celebrations. I thought that if we could win the match, that we would give ourselves a chance. I, I respected Brentford a lot. Um, we created a, a very special match plan. Brentford's a very special team. And like one of the best things was, I had a hard time sometimes, with Rafinha wanted to be on the touchline a lot. And the penalty goal that we score to go up one nil, he's actually inside. Their goalkeeper tries to play a connection and he steps in to win it. He's inside with the fans there as well. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, the, the, the point is that it was the reward, I think, for the players and for the fans, for the hard work. And, and I believe that Leeds United deserves to be, as a club, deserves to be in the Premier League. I'm really, so, really happy to see them doing well this year, and I'm hopeful that they can find their way back. Of course. 
it was a great vote of confidence for you. You had then the summer to plan the development, but that came up with a challenge because you had to lose a couple of big performers in, in Rafinha, who was such a vital part at the end of that season, and also Calvin Phillips, who'd been such a consistent performer for Leeds United, and that uh, returned a lot of money, £105 million, which saw you in a profit, but you got to spend. You got to bring in six players of, of note, I suppose. Um, how do you reflect on that summer of business? Yeah, I liked all the players we brought in. Uh, and, and when I say we, you know, I know a lot of times in, in England, they talk about the manager's transfers. And we didn't operate that way. Like as a club, we really made decisions. And obviously it looks like they're my transfers when it's an American and some Red Bull players. Well, exactly, yeah. But I think we all felt internally as we were shifting the team into this style of football that having some players that could both at Luis Sinistera and Mark Roca and, and Willie Nanto that could meet the standards of how we wanted to play the game and believe that had a high ceiling for how we could develop them along with some players that had been around the system was a good recipe to try to build a team that was going to be successful moving forward. It was a harder second season um, and you were talking before off air actually a little bit to us about key moments of the season which which you felt kept you in the job but this was the situation when you actually left 20 games in outside the bottom three um, but it was also tight at the bottom with with um, with West Ham Wolves and Leicester only just above you and you had that game in hand as well earlier in the show Jesse was talking about the fact that you you felt the performances were there and you would have got leads over the line. And you mentioned underlying numbers. So we pulled this graphic together, actually, Jesse, of, of um, some of those numbers that you may or may not have been referring to at that stage. Uh, have a little look at this. And does this sort of back up your view that it would have been a successful end to the season if you had been given the time? Yeah, those numbers are good. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the one that was the most difficult to, to come to terms with was how to prevent ourselves from giving up bad goals. But this one, to me, is maybe the most important, right? The XG difference. difference yeah. That really, I think, tells you about where you sit in the table versus your competitors. In the end, I felt like we sh we, the way we played in a lot of matches, we should have had a lot more points, right? We, we should have had more wins. We, some games that we drew, we should have won. Some that we lost, we should have drawn. But it didn't work out that way, and it puts well, stress. Well, a, well, a lot of managers say that who were down there at the, at the bottom. Yeah. You know, they'd be saying the same sort of things. But when you look at the underlying numbers, and it's something we look at a lot on this show, but how long can you use that with maybe your own players to keep them sort of believing, maybe with your your owners actually saying, actually, look at these type of numbers. Yeah. How, how, how was the dynamic when you're sort of fighting for your job, but you're still no. looking and thinking the team are playing well? I enjoyed, first of all, the, working with the players was fantastic. I mean, they, they fought and gave everything they had for me. Uh, I appreciated working with them. I, I, I really enjoyed the whole process and the team that we were becoming. And so even earlier when I said I was heartbroken, really, it was really difficult for me to say goodbye. And I never did say goodbye to them because I couldn't. I couldn't stand in front of them because I knew I'd break down. And I, so I just individually dealt with a lot of them. But of course, there are always going to be questions coming from above when the results aren't going the way that they should be. And so then you have to have discussions and try to now walk through the process of what you think is happening. And then in the end, decision makers have to make decisions. And so I understand why, thing, why decisions get made. Obviously, I wish it would have been different. And I firmly believe that we were on the track to, to get the results that were necessary and continue to build. But... This is football. That was a fascinating watch. Listen, you talk about your tactical approach and, and the, the ideas that you were trying to bring into Leeds United. And we saw that with some of those underlying numbers. You know, you, the sprints, uh, the, the um, PPDA numbers, which showed how successful you were at getting the team to really press. The best it was in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. Do you think, though, that your style of football is better suited to other leagues than the Premier League? No. I think, again, any time... So there's always, like, we adapted as we went through the season, how we pressed, how we built, you know, some different tactical, pragmatic things that we tried to do to try to manage what, where we were losing 
parts of the pitch, where we were winning parts of the pitch, how to manage that to help us get results, because that's in the end, that's my job, is to get results. And then you always have to have time to build the squad in the direction that is necessary so that everything is aligned from the academy to the player pool, to the coaching staffs, in all ways. Can I, can I ask you something, what Dave just mentioned there, because you said something earlier on off camera which I found interesting. Leeds was actually the first time you'd gone into a job where you were actually at the bottom end of the table. Yeah. More often than not, you're at the top end of the table yeah. in the different leagues. And normally, certainly in the Premier League, when we see a, a change of manager near the bottom, it's normally to make a team better defensively. Yeah. Keep clean sheets, that's the way of staying up, see if you can nick a game 1-0. Whereas your probably philosophy and pressing high and being high up the pitch is different to that. Do you think that's sort of a problem for you if you go in at the bottom end of the table? Well, I don't, we are a high pressing team, but for me that doesn't necessarily dictate where on the pitch you are, right? So a lot of matches, we don't press the goal kick. We actually come deeper and come closer to the center circle because compactness is more important to us than always having pressure on the ball. We want to have the kinds of pressing where we're all together and compact and this idea of the net doesn't get stretched because the more it gets stretched, the harder it is for us to control spaces, yeah. right? So it's not just about always being in the opponent's end and it's not just about now pressing high and, and, and being closer to goal. It's about managing the opponent and now making sure that you can control more of what's happening in the match than they can. The challenge when you're at the lower end is the reality, when you look at the talent disparities, <laughs> it's, you're, this is why, I mean, I've said thin margin of error probably five times this whole uh, show because the reality is for six of these clubs, that's the truth. It's just the margin of error is, is next to and nothing. And you've been working with Zabozlais and Nkunkus and Haaland. Yeah, yeah. And... No, and that was great. But, it, it, you know, in Salzburg it was, okay, now we're going to play at Liverpool, now we're going to play at Bayern and Atletico Madrid. And, and so now, again, that margin of error is incredibly thin. F final thought, Jesse. It's a heck of a pitch for anyone who might be thinking of employing you tonight. Um, what would be your dream scenario moving forward? I, for me, it's, it's obviously, I love the Premier League, okay? And I love the power of what the league means globally. Um, but honestly, the, the true answer is I, I, I want to find people, like-minded people, you know, that are committed to, to, to people, to development, to relationships, to, to building something. And that might mean that Maybe, I don't know, you know, I've been kind of hoping that we can find some kind of um, connection back in the Premier League. If that doesn't come, then I have to decide what else is out there and what's next for me. Did you turn down the Southampton job when they were fighting in the Premier League? Was, was that an opportunity to get back into the Premier yeah, League? Yeah, I mean, you know, listen, I, I, don't, I don't like when things get out. So, like, when South, the Southampton and Leicester situations get out that I, that I decided not to go there, this... I don't want anybody to know this because I just like having conversations that I believe are intimate and can get to the bottom of, is this going to be a good working relationship and, and are we aligned with the way we think about life and football? But the way that this world works is someone sees you somewhere or somebody says something to the wrong person and information gets out and all of a sudden it explodes. But in general, I've been thankful to have more conversations that are quieter, that where we can really try to determine, is it a right fit? Do we both, are we aligned? Do we want to move forward together? Do we have the same ideals as to, to what it takes to be successful? Jesse, thank you. It's been absolutely Brilliant. fascinating. Thank you. thank you so much for sharing as well. Yeah, and we have, right a, on, we have um, rest defense for our terminology okay. now. Jamie That's will be dropping that in next week. <laughs> <laughs>